give me hugs. Oh, I love you, snake eyes. You are my baby. Come on. I love you. Come on. Okay, go press the button. I hope this is forever. I know this is forever. Okay, go press the button. That's a video of Kira Dixon Johnson with her oldest son, little Charles. Four months later, on April 12, 2016, a pregnant Kira and her husband, Charles Johnson, joyfully headed to Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles, where they plan to welcome their second child. Surrounded by family, including Charles's mother, Glenda Hatchett, star of the TV court show Judge Hatchett, Kira prepared for a scheduled C-section. At 2.33 p.m., Charles and Kira Johnson welcomed a healthy baby boy, Langston. Less than 12 hours after that video was taken, Kira Dixon Johnson was pronounced dead. Here to tell us what exactly happened in between and how this tragic event will help pregnant mothers worldwide is Charles Johnson. Charles, good to see you. Good to see you. Yo, first of all, thank you all so much for having me. Um, but... You know, first of all, when we talk about Kira, it's just so important to understand, we're talking about just sunshine personified, right? Mm. We're talking a woman that raced cars, who spoke five languages fluently. Wow. There was a skydiver, right? Mm. We were ecstatic when we found out we welcomed our second son, Langston. And um, so on April 12th of 2016, our doctor's recommendation, uh, we went into Cedar sinai for what was expected to be a routine scheduled C-section. Okay. Uh, so we went in for the procedure um, around 12.30 in the afternoon. And as you all shared, at 2.30, Langston was born. Mm. And so this is it, as you heard. He shows up perfectly healthy. He's got 10 fingers, 10 toes. Mm. He's super <laughs> handsome looking just like me, right? <laughs> like, it doesn't get any better than this. It really right. just doesn't get any better than this. And so uh, shortly after that, they take us back to recovery. And uh, Langston is sitting there taking a nap. He's resting a little... Mm -hmm the little toaster thing, the little yeah. incubator thing, right, <laughs> I call it. And Kira is just resting. I'm just sitting there just soaking it all in, right? right. All that pride uh, of just being a father for the second time and everything that we talked about, everything that we prayed for, right. it was finally here. Right. Uh, and as I'm sitting there just soaking all this in, as I'm watching Kira rest, as I look down by her bedside, I begin to see the catheter coming from her bedside begin to turn pink with blood. That would be her Foley catheter that's correct. coming from her bladder. Correct, correct, correct. Okay. And I'm like, whoa, something's not quite right. So I bring it to the attention of the doctors and the nurses at Cedar sinai And they come in, they assess Kira, they, they examine her physically. They do a couple of things at this point. They do the physical examination, um, but then they also order a CT scan that's supposed to perform STAT, right? right? And when they say STAT, to me, that means immediately. It means immediately. Right? You're not wrong. So, five o'clock comes. One hour An after hour a close supposed stat CAT scan. Correct. No CT scan, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm asking. They're telling me it's coming. Six o'clock comes. Mm -hmm. Right now, they're coming back in. They're checking her. They were doing additional ultrasounds so they can see that her abdomen is filling with blood. The blood work came back abnormal and it's showing that all of her blood levels are abnormally low. So there were very clear signs very early on that Kira was hemorrhaging significantly internally. Mm -hmm. Wow. But still no CT scan. They still haven't taken her back for surgery. Mm -hmm. Seven o'clock comes, right? Still no CT scan. What are you doing during right. all this time? Like as a as a as a new father, yeah. as a husband, what is what's happening to you right now? I'm trying to remain calm. I'm also ha I'm also trying to make sure that Kira is comfortable because she's in a lot of she's in a lot of pain and discomfort. And I'm also trying to make sure that this brand new baby that's hours old has all the proper vitals that he's eating mm -hmm. that he's on track, right? Right. Uh, and that's the thing right there. Just a lot of times when people deliver, there is so much focus on the baby. Yes. Right. The attention is on the baby, and so many times the mother, it's like, oh, she's delivered, she's good. In hearing your story, to me, even though the cat skin didn't come, how much more evidence do you need? You've had multiple ultrasounds. She's just had a C-section. We know one of the big complications is hemorrhage. She, the blood levels are dropping. She needs to go to the OR. Yeah. And uh, forget even the cat scan. Right. You had to be, you knew that. Yeah. 
You're not even a doctor and you knew that. I knew that, right. And that had to be the most horrible position to be in. Absolutely. At what point did you realize that Kira was not okay? Um, I probably think that it's probably closer to around 8 or 9 o'clock. And I'm wow. just continuing to watch our condition go downhill. Yep. And we're continuing to inquire about the CT, and we're, CT scan. We're continuing to inquire about the surgery. Until up to the point around 9 o'clock, I found a staff member at Cedar sinai And I pulled to the sign, I'm, I pulled to the side, I'm asking, please, look, there was a CT scan that was ordered hours ago. It still hasn't come. We've been asking, we've been begging, please, can you help us? And she looks me dead in my eyes and she says, sir, your wife just isn't a priority right now. Whoa. Yeah. Who your said that to you? Your wife just isn't a priority, a nurse at Cedar sinai Hospital. Wow. Wow. Did you just explode? Like, I, I would I, have. Yeah, that. How do you, how? How do you react to that? So I'll be as transparent as I possibly can. I was boiling and I was angry, but you have to understand that there's so many layers to this. And so there's a layer of patient advocacy, but there's also the layer as an African-American male sure. mm -hmm. wanting to understand that if I raise my voice, mm -hmm. if I become right. irate, then I become seen as a threat. Right. And I am responsible first and foremost for my wife's well-being and advocating for her. It wasn't until after midnight that they finally took Kira back to the OR for surgery. And the doctor says to us, I remember it like it was yesterday, he says, it's not a big deal. Oh. Sometimes these things happen. Mm. I'm going to go back in through the same incision I made earlier for the cesarean. I'm going to find out what's going on. She'll be back in 15 minutes. Wow. And so I'm out there and I'm pacing, I'm waiting, and finally the door is open, and a set of residents come walking towards me, at which point they tell me when they opened Kira up that there was a lot of blood, and that she coded, her heart stopped. Right. A, a lot of blood. Mm. Three and a half liters of three blood. And a half liters. When they opened Kira, there were right. three and a half liters of blood in her abdomen. Understand that the average person has about five liters of blood circulating in their body at one time. She lost more than half of her blood volume before she was finally taken in. But then they go on to tell me that her situation is critical and they're continuing to work on her. And so I tell them, thank you for letting me know, but I need you to get back in there and bring me my wife back, mm -hmm. right. right? Probably about 45 minutes later, the same set of double doors open, the same two residents come through those doors, along with another doctor who I later, later found out was a trauma surgeon they come through those doors and they give me the news that Kira had passed away and there was nothing else they could do to save her. Mm. Twelve hours earlier, I walked into Cedar sinai Hospital with a woman that was not only in good health, but exceptional health, mm. anticipating the birth of a baby that was going to be exceptionally healthy as well. And the fact that she would not leave that hospital to raise her sons never crossed my mind. You did everything you could as a father and a husband. And Maybe you have questions about that now. Yeah. I think hopefully you'll get to a place where you realize, you know, none of that was your fault. You did everything you could. Right. I can't imagine the pain. Thank you so much for sharing the story. Like, I can't imagine what it's like to tell that story over and over yeah. again. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't imagine you not telling the story right. either, right? Because mm -hmm. it definitely needs to be told. Absolutely. So up next, we're going to talk about the work that Charles is doing right now to help prevent this from happening to other families. Plus, we're going to learn what everyone can do to protect their health rights. So stay with us. What I'm here to tell you is this is there's no statistic that can quantify what it's like to tell an 18 month old that his mother's never coming home. There's no matrices that can quantify what it's like to explain to a son that will never know his mother just how amazing she was. My wife deserved better. Women all over this country deserve better. In 2018, the United States of America has the highest rate of maternal deaths in the developed world. Every single year, we mourn roughly 700 mothers who are lost to complications during their pregnancy. 
We're back with Charles Johnson, whose wife Kira tragically lost her life in the hospital just 12 hours after giving birth to their son, Langston. Also joining us now is former senior policy and research analyst for the Presidential Commission on Bioethics, Nicole Strand. Nicole currently serves as the assistant director for research at the Center for Urban Bioethics at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. Welcome, Nicole. Good to see you. Thanks for coming. So for those who may not be familiar, what exactly is bioethics and how would that be involved in a situation like this? Bioethics. But bioethicists think about things like not just what can we do scientifically, not just what healthcare can we deliver, but what should we do? Um, what's the right thing to do um, when we have all this advancing science and technology and medicine? You know, how can we slow down and think about how to be a good person as we're practicing that? So part mm -hmm. of what I do is teach future medical students how to be good people. Mm. So Charles, we just saw the clip of you testifying um, before Congress. How did that come about for you? So. As I began to advocate and just really just do everything I could to raise awareness about this maternal mortality crisis, I wanted to figure out how I could do um, substantial change. And I found out about this piece of legislation that was authored by a congresswoman by the name of Jamie Herrera Butler out of Washington State. Mm -hmm. And what this bill is, is it's a bill called H.R. 1318, which is the Preventing Maternal Deaths Act. And what this bill does is it gives funding to the CDC to create what are called maternal mortality review committees in all 50 states. So essentially what will happen now is that when one of these women passes away from childbirth, there will be a commission in that state that will investigate and collect the data in a standardized way so we can learn everything that we can about this. And so I had the opportunity to do a lot of meeting with a lot of congressmen and women, a lot of senators in support of this bill. And so I was honored when I had the opportunity to be invited to uh, testify before Congress about the need for this and the impact that this maternal mortality crisis is having on families across this country. Yeah. It, it is shocking when you think that in the United States the numbers would be so high. Yeah. So Nicole, let's talk about some of the reasons why maternal mortality is on the rise in this country. What are we doing wrong? Or are we just noticing it more? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things going on. So women are getting pregnant a little bit later in life, so they have more complex medical histories by the time they're coming in to give birth. Um, also, our healthcare system is so fragmented. So some women have really great health insurance and are getting great doctors, and others are not getting a lot of good prenatal care, not getting a lot of good checkups, um, you know, only getting emergency care, they don't have insurance. And so with our fragmented system and, you know, all kinds of different hospitals doing different kinds of things, um, women are experiencing a, a whole array of different experiences in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's been talked about is that amongst women of color that this number is much higher. Um, why is that? What's happening? I think there's a couple of reasons. So one of them is that what we know now, what we understand from research is that racism itself um, actually increases what's called your allostatic load. So it actually increases the stress in your body and the cortisol and hormones that are running through your body. And this can actually have physiological, biological impacts. So mm. it can make you more susceptible to things like um, heart attacks and strokes and high blood pressure and other things that are particularly problematic for people so who are pregnant. So just to clarify, you're saying when you factor in things like racism right. and that makes me even more vulnerable. That's right. And not just in the hospital, but throughout the course of your life, you're accumulating those stress hormones mm. because gotcha. of all the ways you experience racism in your everyday life. So and there's also... Um, women of color are more likely to be preeclamptic, right? They're more likely to have complications. There is a, a, a poverty issue related to the quality of health care, um, access to health care, all of these things. It, it, it's a multifaceted mm -hmm. it problem yeah. that needs to be addressed. This is something that we have to wrap our hands around because it just shouldn't happen. Right. In 2019, a healthy woman should not go into a hospital to deliver a baby and die from hemorrhage. It just shouldn't happen. Absolutely. Well, Charles, let me ask you a question. Um, as a black male and a black female going into the hospital, what's happening for you as you're learning this? Because you probably weren't thinking about any of this prior to, you know, you just thought you were having another beautiful baby boy. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think we have to
come straight down the pipe. And in addition to all the things that you've mentioned that are very poignant, right, with the social determinants of health, the other th factors that you mentioned, there is still an element of racism that is fatal for African American women in this country. And the statistics are there to back it up. When we talk about this issue, what I hear time and time again from women from all backgrounds, but particularly women of color, is that they were failed to be seen as human. Mm. The people that were responsible for these women's care are having a difficult time seeing them the same way that they see their mother, their daughter, their wives. Right. And the reality of the situation is in civilized society, we have that luxury to have our biases. But if the people are responsible for their well-being and the lives of other people, that we can't have that, right? They have to take steps to get better. Yeah. Right. I, as someone who's worked in the medical community, I've seen that exist among entire patient populations, regardless right. of color. When you have people working in a situation, like an emergency room, which I've done for 20 years, every day it becomes that kind of a thing where people become callous. They right. become less connected. And it's a, a very difficult thing to manage and to try to rise above. Sure. But to have this additionally added to it, it just, it just it makes it that much more complicated. Right. So Nicole, let me ask you, what is the medical community doing to address these kinds of issues, this high maternal mortality rate? Yeah, so I think one of the things we have to do is we have to recognize that this implicit bias is real. And if we all have it, then of course doctors who are people too right. have it as well. But like you said, the consequences are a lot higher. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things we have to do and one of the things I'm doing at the medical school I teach at is talking to medical students about this bias, talking about racism, um, having them work through their own biases, having them practice with patients to kind of try to m get over that, to try to th see people as, as humans and, um, and move past some of these things that we all sort of live with. Mm. And I think we need even more than that. We need doctors, they don't get as much training focusing on the mom after Absolutely. delivery. I, I've lived it. I've worked in the hospital. I've worked on labor and delivery. There's this you know, understanding that, oh, the woman gave birth, she just goes right up to the floor, it's all done. Yeah. Everyone's worried about the baby. Mm -hmm. How's the baby doing? How's the baby doing? There's a mom that just had major surgery, mm -hmm. and they get whisked up to the floor. So we have to look at the whole system and how we're doing it. Yeah. It definitely has to be fixed, and I know Cedar sinai is looking into their procedures. But I want to talk to you about your foundation that you started. Yeah. What, what does that mean to you, and what are you trying to do? So, um... I started a foundation to pay honor to Kira called Four Kira Four Moms. So it's the number four K I R A, the number four moms, uh, M O M S. So, um, although there's nothing that we can do to bring Kira back, mm -hmm. the highest honor that we can pay her is to do everything we can to send other mothers home with their precious babies, right? right? Mm -hmm. So, we're doing a lot of things that I'm extremely proud for, in addition to advocating and fighting for legislation that was passed yeah. and additional legislation. Um, we're doing things to support families that have lost mothers. So a lot of the things we're doing with the foundation are reverse engineered about what is it that I wish that I had on April 12th of sure. 2016. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we're really proud of is what we're calling our maternal mortality response team. And what this is going to do is any time that we lose a mom in this country, anywhere in this country, we're going to be able to mobilize a team anywhere in this country to support that family within 72 hours. Wow. Right? Mm -hmm. To be on the ground to support that family with the practical things that they need, like diapers, formula. I don't want them to think about having to buy a diaper for a year, mm -hmm. right? Then beyond that, the emotional support thing that they need, things that they need, grief counseling for the family and extended family. Right. So in the short time of your advocacy, you've already really done some great things on the ground and got things mobilized. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited and I'm, I'm proud of what we're doing. We have a lot of work to do. Sure. We have a lot of yeah, work sure. to do. Sure. And you can support us. So uh, you can find us at 4cure4moms.com. Okay. Um, you can follow us on all social media at the number 4 K-R-R-A, the number 4 M-O-M-S, 4 okay. Cure 4 Moms. Yeah. Thank you so much Thank for you. being here. Yeah. I mean, it's an incredibly important conversation, but an incredibly you know, difficult story to tell, yeah. but thank you for being courageous enough to tell it and, you know, to just be on the ground and, and try to make a difference in yeah. families' yes. lives. You and know, we're, we you. really do appreciate you coming in because yeah. hopefully this can make a difference and help fix this problem, which right. is, should not be happening. Thanks guys so much for yeah, coming in. We appreciate it. All right. Thanks. We'll be right back.